Great. Welcome, everyone. I hereby call the meeting to order. I'm Ken Weinstein, Chairman of the Broadcasting Board of Governors. This is an open meeting of the Broadcasting Board of Governors being held in compliance with the Sunshine Act. A digital recording of this meeting will be available for online viewing on the BBG website, www.bbg.gov. Joining us by phone are Governors Ryan Crocker and Michael Kempner. Joining us here today are Governor Cornblue and Acting Assistant Secretary Susan Stevenson, whom I'd like to uh, welcome. Susan Stevenson is the Acting Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Public Affairs of the U.S. Department of State. As many of you know, Ambassador Warden retired at the end of September. Steve, Stephen Goldstein has been nominated by the President as the new Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs, also known as R in state speak. <laughs> While Steve awaits his appointment confirmation, Susan is here today to represent R, carrying out the Secretary's responsibility with regard to the BBG. As previously mentioned around this table, this board has benefited immensely by its strong partnership with the State Department and particularly with the Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. And I'd like to welcome Susan and ask her if she wishes to make uh, some remarks. Yes, thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, I want, on behalf of the State Department, to reiterate the importance we attach to the BBG's mission to inform, engage, and connect people around the world in the support of freedom and democracy. And also recognize that the cooperation and collaboration between BBG and the Department of State is essential while still remaining, re maintaining and respecting the firewall. It's a nice homecoming for me because I joined the government under USIA when we were all one family, and so I'm happy to be back representing state. Um, our collaboration on the work of the Global Engagement Center is a perfect example of the collaboration and cooperation between BBG and state. The assignment right now of a BBG detailee to the Global Engagement Center allows us to take advantage of our respective strengths and ensures that we are leveraging our resources efficiently and effectively in combating disinformation and countering extremist methods messaging while making sure we're both not duplicating efforts but complementing each other. Well, thank you very much uh, and welcome back to the family. Glad you could, uh, you're with us, uh, at least for now, and, and, uh, uh, and uh, great to hear more about the important partnership we have with the State Department as well as the firewall that separates us. Now, each time we, we meet, we pause to recognize the difficult working conditions many of our journalists operate in, oppressive regimes that threaten and harass our journalists on a regular basis, and our journalists obviously become regularly, unfortunately, become victims of cowardly terrorists and other extremists. It's important to highlight these incidents since our last board meeting. First, I'm sad to report that the horrific, about the horrific bomb blast in Mogadishu on October 14th, which directly affected the VOA family. Somali Stringer Abdul, Abdul, Abdul Qadir Mohammed Abdule, Abd, excuse me, Abdul Qadir Mohammed Abdul was injured while freelance cameraman Ali Noor Siad, working with Abdul on assignment for VOA, was killed in the blast. Siad was 31 years old. His picture is right there. Also killed that day was Ahmed Abdi Karin Iyu, a valued member of the Somali community in Minneapolis and a trusted friend of VOA. Iyu was instrumental in making VOA's town hall between the Somali diaspora in Minnesota and citizens in Mogadishu, which was very memorable and which was reported on at an earlier board meeting possible. Please join me in a moment of a silence for these brave men. Thank you. In addition to this horrific incident in Mogadishu, there have been a number of incidents in which our journalists have been targeted. Just today, we hear that two former RFA journalists have been arrested in Cambodia and held for over 24 hours. Charges have yet to be filed, but it's being reported that they are under suspicion of working for Radio Free Asia. These arrests are further evidence of a regime hell-bent on crushing the free press and free speech. The message from Hun Sen, it's clear the mere suspicion of providing news can be construed as espionage. This is blanket harassment aimed at instilling fear. On to other uh, difficult cases, and our thoughts and prayers are with uh, 
all the all of our uh, all of our uh, colleagues uh, here at the BBG Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberties, Saparmamed, Nepos Guliev remains in prison in Turkish in Turkmenistan, and Stanislav Asiev continues to be held by pro-Russian separatists in Donetsk. In China's Xiang, uh, Xinjiang province, three Radio Free Asia's, Asia reporters have, have, have had family members jailed or detained over the last few months. Uh, retaliation against family members is a common tactic, as we all know, to try to silence reporters. We join with RFERL President Thomas Kent in his demand for a thorough investigation into the November 7th attack on RFERL Ukrainian Services Schemes Program journalist Mikhailo Takt and his TV crew. They were accosted by masked bodyguards at the Kiev airport while reporting on the arrival from Russia of powerful Ukrainian politician and businessman Viktor Medvedchuk, who leads the pro-Russian Ukrainian Choice Organization. This was not the only Recent incident of harassment of a journalist for schemes on October 22nd, RFERL published footage of scheme journalist Alexander Chernovalev being followed by unknown men on consecutive days. Additionally, on September 15th, Takt and a cameraman were physically assaulted by members of Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko's security guard. In Pakistan, we've seen a dramatic increase in threats against journalists working at Voice of America's Radio Diwa and RFERL's Radio Michelle and Radio Azidi with threats to these outlets by name. RFERL's Radio Michelle was forced to take special measures to protect its reporters in northwest Pakistan after a separatist group threatened to attack Pakistani journalists whom they claim are biased in their news coverage in favor of the government. In 2017, no fewer than four Radio Michelle journalists have been threatened, stalked, kidnapped for up to 72 hours, fired upon or otherwise harassed both by the Taliban and by Pakistan intelligence agency officials. Across Africa, VOA journalists continue to face harassment and threats. On September 27th, VOA Portuguese to Africa stringer Moniz Mukibele was working on assignment when he was detained by police who questioned and beat him. And on October 12th, Swahili stringer Kenneth Bawiri was one of four local journalists robbed outside their homes after reporting on parliamentary resistance to removing presidential age limits. Uh, and obviously, these are very dire circumstances that our colleagues in the field uh, face, and our, and our thoughts and prayers are with them, and uh, in the hope that uh, by speaking about the very difficult consider conditions under which they uh, work under and the, very, and the very direct threats to their lives, as we've seen, uh, that uh, bringing some light on this will uh, help uh, others who may be facing similar similar uh, distress. Now we return to now we turn to today's board business. The quorum of five or more governors satisfies the board's quorum requirement. A quorum being present, the board may conduct business based on majority vote. On November first, the board received by email materials for the consent agenda, which allowed sufficient time for all governors to review the agenda prior to the meeting. We did not receive comments from any governors, and this month's consent agenda is at tabs six through eight. And at this time, I'd like to ask if ask the governors if they have any comments on the consent agenda. There being none, let me ask if any governors wish to move for adoption of the consent agenda by the board. I so move. Ambassador Cornblue. Seconds. Okay. Moves. Is there a second? I second. Okay. Acting Assistant Secretary Stevens. So, so moves, okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any objections? Okay, there are none. Now we move to the public comment section of the meeting. The board permits members of the public who register to attend our open meetings the opportunity to speak for up to three minutes each. I understand that today we have three members of the public who wish to make remarks. I would ask that each of you keep your remarks to three minutes in order to allow time for other speakers. Please come up to the table and introduce yourself before you speak. Great. Right now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Director Lansing, Governors, ladies and gentlemen. 
My name is Adam Powell. I'm the President of the Public Diplomacy Council and Director of Washington Programs for the University of Southern California Annenberg Center on Communication, Leadership, and Policy. These remarks do not represent the views of those organizations. They are solely my own. Imagine for a moment that we are in an alternative universe. High-level State Department managers are being nominated and confirmed and are taking part in public events. Most in this town, in this country, would find that good news. Most in this town, this country, would be surprised to learn that we are living in that alternative universe. The reason for the surprise is that media have ignored arrivals at state, choosing only to report departures. Two hours ago, I typed in Deputy Secretary of State and John J. Sullivan into Google News. The only reporting was from abroad. No U.S. media were reporting. African media in English and French were reporting uh, Deputy Secretary Sullivan's visit to Africa that began there yesterday. Today he is in Khartoum in a visit described by the Sudan Tribune as the first visit of a senior U.S. diplomat to Sudan since long years ago. U.S. media are silent. Of course, this is an opportunity for those of you around this table. Rather than curse the darkness, you can light a candle or two or three and uh, fill the gap in reporting. Two hours ago, I also typed into Google News the name of the person nominated to serve as the new Undersecretary for Public Diplomacy, along with uh, that title. The response to both searches was, your search, Erwin Stephen Goldstein, did not match any documents. No coverage. The new Undersecretary of State for Public Diplomacy, if he's confirmed by the Senate, he's already been approved by the committee, is a non-person to U.S. media. Two weeks ago today, he testified before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and for those who were not there or have not seen the reporting posted on the Public Diplomacy Council website, I would like to read a few excerpts of his prepared remarks. We need to show how America is leading the fight against AIDS and malaria in places where these diseases take their deadliest toll. We need to show how America is bringing educational opportunity to girls and boys and nations where schooling is still seen as a privilege and not a right. From textbooks to scholarships, to coding academies, America is empowering the world through education. We need to show how America is often the first nation to provide aid when disaster strikes. Through government agencies such as USAID, through our robust private sector, and in our own capacity as individuals, Americans ease suffering and help rebuild lives in every corner of the globe every day. To tell these stories, we must ensure that the State Department is using every tool available and can harness the power of new technologies as they develop. Consistent with the President's budget and the Secretary's priorities, we should aspire to have a digital and technolo technology profile that rivals the best companies in Silicon Valley. And in an era when people everywhere have access to vast information sources, we must speak to people where they listen. Continuing, I also want to ensure that we're doing everything we can to combat the radical ideologies that threaten Americans at home and abroad. I feel this deeply because I've seen firsthand the heartbreak that occurs when a malign force takes root and diplomacy fails to stop it, referring to his personal experience at Dow Jones. End of quote. The voices of American democracy represented in this room no doubt welcome his words and repeat them in your broadcasts. We look forward to welcoming the new undersecretary to the chair, to the chairman's left. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Powell. Our next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Gang Liu, a Chinese distant during chairman pro-democracy pro movement in 1989. I used to be a big fan of VOA when I was in China. And now I have been a long time user of Twitter, Facebook, Google Blogs, and YouTube for over eight years. I have posted articles, photos, videos nearly on a daily basis on those platforms provided by the above-mentioned social medias. However, I have never been blocked by those social medias. While all those social medias were blocked by Chinese great firewalls, that clearly tells us that those social medias seldom silence Chinese distance. On the contrary, they are really great platforms for our Chinese to enjoy freedom of speech. There are allegations or rumors that those social medias and the VOA were blue, golden, yellowed, which means they are bribed 
or controlled by the Chinese Communist Party and frequently silence the Chinese dissidents. Based on my experiences, that kind of allegations are invalid. When I was in China, I listened to the VOA radio almost every day. I have to say, the v I have to say that the VOA has great reputations in China, and most of our Chinese really love VOA. Why? Because VOA always tells the truth and let us know what really happened in the world. Recently, VOA cut off live stream broadcast while interviewing Mr. Guo Wengui. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube blocked Guo Wengui's accounts. Because of Guo Wengui, VOA and some mainstream media have been frequently challenged or criticized by Chinese-related groups. Some even accused the VOA might be BGWed by the CCP, which means VOA has been bribed or become, became part, uh, part of CCP. That kind of allegations are not fair and has no solid evidences. Based on, based on what had said by Guo Wengui through media, I believe that Guo Wengui has violated the basic rules or laws regarding confidential information and the slanders. Twitter and other social media should block the accounts whoever posted that kind of videos or articles with full of dirty words abusing activities and harmful rumors. Guo Wengui invented the word blue, golden, yellow. Then Mr. Guo and his followers accused any of news media if they don't like it. Here's an, an example. You may remember this person. His name is Zhao Yan. He did testimony right in this room in, uh, on August the 30th. At that meeting, he accused the VOA, was, uh, it's called the Blue, Golden, Yellow by the CCP, which means controlled, bribed by the Chinese Communists. And, that, and the, due to the pressure of the Chinese government, we cut off the live stream while interviewing Guo Wengui. And the right on the, this, this picture, this guy led a large group, did demonstrations right outside the building of VOA. While at the same time, same time he worked as a political, com poli political commentator of VOA. I believe that he violates the ethical rules. Right before yesterday, two days ago, he posted another Twitter on, and this Twitter said that, he, he said that the upcoming BBG meeting has been blocked for registration. The BBG might want to silence us, to silence our Chinese dissidents, or be bribed by the CCP. That means he claimed that he occurred that the board members of this meeting may, be, may receive big amount of money from China. And why he said that he gave evidence, he said he, he gave this picture, said that he cannot register. Why I came to this meeting? Just I found his tweets. I click on the link and I can register. I came here. That definitely proved that he lied. He couldn't understand English. He couldn't find the link. And then he asked people to do demonstration to come to, B to, de to protest the BBG, the, uh, the members of BBG, and claim the BBG board. And that means last time he claimed he accused that VOA was bribed by Chinese communists. This time, 
just because he cannot register, it's his fault. But he claimed he occurred at the board, the BBG board meeting. So this kind, that type of Gwen Gui's trick, they, who, they claim occurs to whoever they don't like. Whoever do not support them, it was occurred that, that these uh, American agencies was bribed by Chinese government. There are so, several other uh, examples. I think uh, my short, uh, short of time, I'll only give a short. Yes, uh, if, if you, yes, time-wise, we're beyond the time, so if you could make this quickly, appreciate it. Thank okay, you. Okay, I'll make a prayer. So it is completely proper for VOA stop going with spreading unverified rumors or false accusations. Otherwise, VOA could be responsible for distributing harmful information and thus lost credits and the audiences in China. It is absolutely correct for Twitter, Facebook, YouTube to block Guan Gui's account to, pre to prevent him encouraging women and insulting other people. Otherwise, this social media could become complices of leaking out of the privacy of others. I appreciate Twitter, Facebook, YouTube for providing platforms for freedom of speech. However, freedom of speech, freedom of speech doesn't mean freedom of hurting others. The harmful speeches should, be, should not be spoiled and should be strictly prohibited. I and many other Chinese are really eager to listen to VOA. I hope VOA should continue to remain true to its mission statement to be accurate, objective, and comprehensive. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Liu. Good afternoon. My name is Frank from New York. On April 19th, 9, uh, 2017, VOA China Service cut a live stream interview with Chinese billionaire Gu Wenghui. So VOA allows someone to speak whatever he is like this through the VOA with live stream and uh, without any interruption? No, definitely not. So VOA have the right to cut the live stream once the speakers violate the rules uh, such as uh, disclosing bank account information, spam the rumors, and send the others uh, like a woman. Yes, of course, yes. My name is, uh, my name is uh, Xian Minxiu, uh, Frank, a journalist uh, for Boston News, a uh, Chinese news media located in uh, New York. Go Wenghui has frequently abused women, a slander other people through the social media. I'm one of such victims who are fell, fell, uh, false accused by Go Wenghui. Here are some examples of Go Wenghui's harmful activities or speeches against me. On March 4th, Go Wenghui met me and uh, threatened to destroy me completely. In late July, Gu Wenghui posted uh, my passport information on Twitter, Facebook, and as well as uh, YouTube. Gu Wenghui even promised to provide a million dollars to those who can kill me. Gu Wenghui repeatedly for accused me that uh, I work for the CCP as a spy agent and received $14 million from the CCP. That is complete a liar. As a matter of fact, I have worked for Bush News, only received $1,000 per month for the last three years. There is a video posted online in which Go Wenghui clearly stated that he would like to pay $3,000 to those who would come to my home and harass me day and night and make me slip the list. Due to Go and Grace repeatedly spread rumors through Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube, 
Many of his followers believe that I am a evil hooligan who should be killed or destroyed. Go and has been spending lies, generating hate, initiate violence through social media. It has been almost one year since Go and became a wish of blower. Now we can see that Go and has not only disclosed corruption information about the Chinese top officials, but also disclosed some private and personal information of normal people and the stir the violence and the great hate. Some of his activities have violated the laws as well as regulations or the rules that both social media and the individuals users should comply with. I have to report on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube and request them to block the Go and Grace improper activities and block his accounts if he continues to violate asset the rules. I believe that my complaint is one of the most important reasons that the Go and Grace account were blocked by these social media. However, Go and Grace and some of his fellows continuously accuse these social medias were bribed or controlled by the CCP. That is another lie and a false accusation. Regardless of whether the CCP complain against Go and Gui, Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube have to stop Go and Gui's improper activities and have to stop him from sending and abusing others through the social media platforms. Similarly, VOA should, should not allow Go and Gui to have live uh, broadcasting for three hours. I think not even for a single minute. VOA should at the least pre-review what Go and Gui would say and shouldn't allow him to spread the rumors and to send, send others. I appreciate VOA's cutting off the live streams interview on April 19th. Otherwise, Go and Gui might broadcast in my passport and other the harmful information, harmful the rumors through the VOA and would have generated countless damage to VOA's reputation. Thank you. Thank you for your coming. Thank you again for your time. God bless you. God bless America. Thank you, Mr. Shu. Now, uh, before I turn it over to uh, Director and uh, to CEO and Director John Lansing for uh, report on agency operations, I want to acknowledge the presence on the phone of uh, two BBG colleagues whom I failed to acknowledge earlier, and that's uh, Governors uh, Kempner and Crocker. Uh, welcome and uh, look and uh, be sure to speak up uh, with questions. I will turn to you for, with questions. Uh, and now it's uh, my honor and pleasure to turn it over to our uh, CEO and Director for a report on uh, BBG operations. Thank you, Chairman Weinstein. Good afternoon, Governors. Thank you very much. I'd like to begin with some personnel uh, changes. You might recall that I introduced Matt Walsh as our new Chief of Staff at the August board meeting, but Matt wasn't here. He felt compelled to be with his wife, who was giving birth that day. So I think you made a good call there, Matt. So welcome. Thanks. It, it went well. It all went well. We have a, a new a new boy now. And yeah. what's his name? Uh, Eamon. Eamon. Eamon Walsh. Awesome. Congratulations on that. And then I'd like to welcome to the agency uh, Dr. Harun Ula from the State Department. He joined us on October 2nd, and he'll be overseeing the Office of Policy and Research including the elevation of BBG's policy engagement in the interagency inter strategic planning and strategic initiatives functions. Um, Haroon's main responsibility is to lead our strategic strategy, a strategic, uh, pardon me, our strategic relevancy uh, with interagency around foreign affairs and all global media spheres. Haroon joins us, as I said, from the State Department where he most rec recently worked on the policy staff for Secretary Tillerson. He has advised three secretaries of state and traveled with Ambassador Holbrook with his Afghanistan-Pakistan team 
and started the first public diplomacy countering violent extremism office at any U.S. embassy in the world. So, Haroon, we're thrilled to have you here. Anything you'd like to say? I'm absolutely excited to be here and thrilled uh, for the welcome and excited to work with all of you closely. And um, now we're going to jump into some ICC highlights. The BBG fosters and sustains free and democratic societies by exemplifying and supporting free media around the world. Our networks pursue this mission through their own engaging content on all platforms, television, radio, internet, social, and mobile platforms, <laughs> and also by working closely with media partners around the world that bring our content into local markets, establishing valuable connections to critical institutions that support civil society and democratic principles. Our networks also advance U.S. national interests by providing audiences in closed societies or where free media is not yet fully established with consistently accurate, compelling, and professional journalism. What I want to do now is invite the ICC to present some highlights from our last, between our last meeting and this meeting that have, have been very, very uh, uh, compelling and interesting. I want to begin with uh, Andre Mendez, who is our CIO CTO and has stepped in as the acting director of the Office of Cuba Broadcasting and oversaw the recent second annual Cuba Internet Freedom Conference, which I was able to attend. And I was also able to spend a, a couple of hours in a roundtable to, to be in conversation with Cuban innovators and entrepreneurs who are championing freedom of expression on the island. And it was very, very useful and helpful for me to be in that conversation. And then the next day was the beginning of the conference. So Andre, go ahead and, and take it over. Very good. Thank you, John. Governors. Um, distinguished folks. Um, first of all, let me tell you how honored I am uh, that I have been given the opportunity to direct this office uh, for uh, as long as I will be there. Um, it is uh, almost unthinkable for me that uh, this office that was started by uh, President Ronald Reagan in the 80s um, is uh, now uh, a home for me at least most of the week, uh, and I can't tell you how honored I am by that. Um, it's uh, it's it's truly is uh, a remarkable honor to be able to uh, help in fulfilling the mission uh, that is so honorable um, and that hopefully I'll be able to uh, move forward during the time that I'm there. I'm going to start with a, a brief video that will uh, show you some highlights from the uh, Cuba Internet uh, Freedom Conference. Obviously, Cuba is one of the countries that has uh, the least amount of availability of, uh, of Internet content for it is its citizens. Uh, it is quite shameful that a country that is 90 miles away from the United States uh, is operating under such, uh, such a manner. Uh, but I think that uh, we saw some uh, very good highlights from, from, this, um, from this conference, uh, really showing the resourcefulness uh, and the, the mental agility of the Cuban population in making sure that despite all of the obstacles that they continue to move forward and try to find innovative ways of uh, sharing information, of accessing information, and of creating a digital environment that, albeit, um, uh, you know, somewhat retrograde in the way it operates today, it will be, um, no, no doubt, the precursor for a freer Internet uh, when the time comes uh, when the regime finally loosens its grip in the power uh, and allows uh, people access. So if we could roll the, uh, the highlights... Welcome to the second Cuban Internet Freedom Conference. Change has come slowly in Cuba, and we're just getting started. But one thing that hasn't changed is the need for access to uncensored information.
Mr. Castro, take down this firewall. Um, that last uh, statement was uh, given with attribution, borrowing it from President Reagan from the famous speech at, uh, at the, uh, in, in Germany uh, back uh, a few years. Um, the, uh, the amount of energy in the room was palpable, and of course you should know that the majority of the participants uh, in, the, in the program came from the island of Cuba uh, and uh, provided us with real live information about the situation in Cuba, uh, not a manufactured environment. Uh, so uh, it was very, very pleasing. Thank you, Andre. Well done. Governors, any questions, comments? No, you, the, you, the, the, you could see the dynamism in the room. It's, it's, I mean, I, it's always inspiring to be with our Cuban partners on the island to hear from them directly about the circumstances they face on a daily basis, how they try to go around things and uh, follow some social media from Cuba uh, on Twitter. What, what's your sense? They, they can come and go freely. Are they harassed when they go back? What's your sense, Andre? And hats off on an incredible conference and uh, all yeah, you're doing down there. The overwhelming majority of it was done before my arrival, so uh, the people that, that have organized it really deserve the credit. Um, you, you, you should all know that two of the people that were supposed to participate were actually detained prior to uh, departing the island and uh, were uh, actually jailed for brief periods of time. And so not all was, uh, you know, fun, fun games. Uh, the uh, the folks that are uh, most uh, famous outside the island uh, enjoy a certain degree of freedom because restricting that freedom would uh, reflect very negatively on the regime. So I believe that that's the only reason why they're allowed to participate in events like this. Um, but uh, there, should be, there should be no question uh, that, that the regime in Cuba is extremely restrictive. And what these uh, in amazingly resourceful individuals have done is effectively create an ecosystem inside of the island that allows them to exchange information, not via the internet per se, but via almost you know, uh, today's version of sneaker net where you take a floppy disk from one computer to another. Well, they get together and via Bluetooth and other proximity technologies like that, exchange content and see it you know, rapidly uh, distribute itself through the island. But make no mistake, you know, it, it's, it's an anachronistic environment that absolutely needs to change. Okay, great, thank you. Very good. Um, but, sh shall I go to the next video? The, uh, no, that's for, that's for later. Oh, okay, very yeah. good, thank you. Uh, be in about uh, 20 minutes. We're just going to do the quick hits here. Um, turning now to Voice of America, um, I think we, we've reported before to the board on the series that Voice of America's Africa division produced on Boko Haram um, based on a trove of video that came into the possession of one of our journalists there. Recently, The Voice put together a documentary based on that and then built out a, a narrative that really, really uh, explores the impact the, the Boko Haram had on the citizens of Nigeria. And I had the honor of introducing it, its premiere at the USIP, US Institute for Peace, a couple of weeks ago. And then Amanda did the same thing in London at the Chatham House. And I just want to give Amanda a chance to talk about the documentary and the rollout of it and the impact that it's having. And then also uh, a little bit of a, of a look at a new uh, a uh, reporter slash anchor at Voice of America, a name that many of you have probably heard, Greta Van Suster, and, and some of the work that she's doing with us. But let's start with the uh, Boko Haram. Thank you, John. Uh, the documentary, which required about as much really deep investigative reporting and, and courage in going back into Boko Haram territory, examines not just the the uh, atrocities committed, but also the effect on society and how Boko and how the Nigerian society is attempting to rebuild itself, uh, even while Boko Haram still um, exists there. Why don't we look at some of the highlights? Unfortunately, if it was addressed sooner, it wouldn't have gotten to the extent that it is. We may never be able to restore those lives. I just want to thank you for causing a Nigerian problem. Men or women, young or old, Christian. Oh, Muslim. Let me first and foremost commend this uh, production. I saw your passion and your commitment there it was non-stop. Indeed, um, it has captured the human dimension. 
It's really very important to understand that Boko Haram is not Nigeria, and Nigeria is not Boko Haram. This video, as John suggests, has been very widely seen, and we have another um, number of things uh, upcoming. And just, just to uh, uh, flip through some of the stills that we took from some of the events in Congress in London at the Institute of Peace, just flipping through a couple of them. Beth Mendelson was the. Yeah, Beth Mendelson was the was the executive producer and was uh, aided by Tom Detzel and a, sta a cast of about thirty five people. All worked very very hard to do this, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity of doing this. And we think it's actually having a great deal of impact both in Nigeria and around the world. Shall I move Greta? to Greta? Mm -hmm. So we've we've been we've been the lucky beneficiaries of a really extraordinary opportunity when after. Um, she left MSNBC recently. Greta von Susteren came to us with the rather unbelievable offer to work for us pro bono. And her, we have been since then benefiting from her passion for and expertise in both the legal issues with which she began her career and foreign affairs, as well as her deep commitment to uh, VOA's unbiased, fact-based, news and information. She's been very passionate about appreciating that aspect of our work, and she has been both a valuable contributor and an enthusiastic supporter through her extremely active public media accounts. And I'd like to just show you a couple of clips from the things that she has already produced for us, and just a little bit of a peek into her social media accounts. What's going to happen, do you think, to the Iran nuclear deal in the Congress? I think the status quo is unacceptable. And you got to understand that President Trump ran on the idea this was a bad deal for the world. From the start of the Russia investigation, much attention has been focused on former Trump campaign manager Paul Manafort. Now, for more on this investigation, I'm joined by VOA contributor Greta Van Susteren. The indictment today against Manafort and Gates, that has probably nothing to do with the Trump White House and the campaign, as far as we know now. Voice of America, say Munslik, Kanuni Maher, Greta Van Sester. And we have no idea. This is the Trump's in the Habi Mohim Similta. We have no idea that this is the same thing. We have no idea that this is the same There is a trail that goes back to the Trump campaign. Senator, um, is it ethnic cleansing or is it genocide what's going on in Myanmar towards the Rohingya um, and what's your opinion and what's the official position of the United States? I don't know the official position of this administration but the kindest uh, take on this is ethnic cleansing. Very good. Thank you very much everyone. Governors, thoughts, questions? I'll start. I just want to congratulate Amanda. This is a huge coup for VOA, uh, and it's terrific to see how excited Greta Van Susteren is, how available she's made herself, and uh, the uh, the work that she's doing. It's uh, hats off. It's it's uh, it's 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 very exciting, and uh, will certainly raise our visibility both in the United States and around the world. And I. I I also appreciate her social media expertise in which she is very clearly appreciating us for all the right reasons. She has a very deep appreciation for a neutral, objective, fact-based news organization, and she can't stop uh, promoting the, that aspect of Voice of America. So I, I, I'm really very glad about this. Okay. Thank you, Amanda. Switching now to Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. 
Uh, Tom Kent will update you on some tensions that have, have been developing over the uh, past several months in Moscow related to our presence there, our bureau there. Before I toss it to Tom, I just want to make a point, and that is, as you know, uh, Russian media in the U.S. is easily found, RT and Sputnik. In fact, Sputnik is on a local Washington radio station right now, and then RT is on cable systems all over the country, and there's a reason for that, and the reason is we're a free and open society. Uh, the same is not true for U.S.-based media, including our own media in Russia. We're blocked from cable and satellite and terrestrial uh, broadcasting for radio and TV completely. And so uh, in that framework, I'd like for you to understand from Tom what tensions are rising at this point and what impact uh, they may have on our very, very limited footprint and presence in Russia. So Tom, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, John. Good afternoon, Governors. I'd like to give you an update on the new challenges RFERL and VOA are facing to our operations in Russia. Before dawn today, our time, the lower house of the Russian parliament passed a bill stating that media subsidized from outside the country can be labeled and treated as foreign agents. The bill is expected to go to the upper house next week, be signed by President Putin, and then administered by the Ministry of Justice. It's not clear at this point what the law would mean if applied to us, and indeed many Russian officials say openly that the law specifically has us in mind. At the very least, it would likely involve extensive and expensive registration requirements. We would also be subject to ongoing monitoring of, an our, of our activities by the Ministry, with details and consequences still undefined. According to various accounts, any violation of whatever rules are imposed on us could be punishable by those involved facing three years in prison. Some Russian officials had suggested even more drastic steps against us, like declaring RFERL and VOA undesirable organizations whose very existence would be <coughs> illegal in Russia. <coughs> Nothing done today limits the use of other tools against us in the future. The latest parliament action comes against a real kaleidoscope of extravagant and often conflicting Russian claims about RFERL and VOA. Sometimes the assertion is that we've totally penetrated Russia for purposes of undermining the government. Sometimes authorities claim we have no influence at all. Most lately, officials say Moscow is simply making a calibrated, measured response to RT's registration as a foreign agent in the United States. Let me show you the more alarmist flavor of Russian reaction to our work. In July, Russian television broadcast this program implying the BBG, RFERL, and VOA are propaganda agencies under State Department control. The broadcast suggested the BBG takes credit for the Ukrainian revolution and under its mission has the same thing in mind for Russia. We'll play it for you in the original music and all. Конференцируется Конгрессом США, отчитывается перед налогоплательщиками и президентом страны, а в состав правления по должности входит госсекретарь. Распространять информацию организации позволено исключительно за пределами Америки. Переворот на Украине – результат, который в BBG заслуженно приписывают себе. На странице официального сайта в подразделе «Кто мы такие?» единственная фотография. Боевики Евромайдана в касках, балаклавах и с дубинками. In a similar vein, the head of RT expressed her worries about our profile inside Russia. Let's see the quote there. Tom, can you read that quote? Sure. An enormous number of American and other media operate in Russia, including in the Russian language. I can praise them. They work marvelously. They have enormous budgets. It may surprise you, but by some measures, for example, how often they're cited on social networks, Radio Liberty is already number one among all Russian radio stations. Now, by other Russian accounts, we're not a threat at all, but boring and irrelevant. Here is Dmitry Kiselyov of Russian television. В прошлый вторник на Россию стал вещать русскоязычный телеканал под скучным названием «Настоящее время». Это совместный продукт двух команд «Вражья голосов», как раньше их называли, «Радио Свобода» и «Голоса Америки». Затея и бюджет еще с обамовских времен. 
По большому счету, как говорится, отмывание бабок под предлогом борьбы с русской пропагандой. И главное, ничего человеческого. И когда смотришь, полное чувство, что мы им там не нужны. Вещают не отсюда, как и раньше, из-за бугра. И делают вид, что лучше знают, что здесь надо. 24 часа, 7 дней в неделю. Пустое дело. Россияне почему-то отказываются смотреть телеканалы и слушать радиостанции, которые интересы США ставят выше интересов России. Whatever the Russians really think about our impact, the current situation has made us think more about one point they keep emphasizing, reciprocal rights between U.S. and Russian media. As John noted, in the U.S., RT has access to cable television, <coughs> Sputnik is on American radio. In Russia, RFERL is barred from cable television. The radio channels we once had in close to 40 cities have all been shut down. Our contributor, Mikola Simina, was convicted in court for an article he wrote and was barred from public activity. Another, Stanislav Asayev, as you noted, Chairman Weinstein, is being held by pro-Russian separatists in Ukraine and threatened with 14 years in jail. We would be pleased if the current focus on reciprocity between Russian and American media ends by giving us the same rights in Russia that Russian networks have in the United States. Bravo. Well said, Tom. Governors, any questions, comments? Okay, so moving on now, thank you, Tom, to uh, Radio Free Asia. As you know, Radio Free Asia operates in some of the most closed societies in the world and is currently doing some excellent work um, in a country that is increasingly becoming concerning for us, and that's Myanmar, where we see the Rohingya uh, being pushed out, and you have been doing some, Bay Fang is here, our executive editor for RFA, been doing some incredible work covering that particular story, so why don't you update the governors on that, please. Thanks so much, Sean. Um, today what I'd like to do is share with the board the, the work that we've been doing on the Rohingya crisis. Uh, the Rohingya have been called the world's most persecuted minority group, and we at RFA have considered it our duty to give voice to their plight as well as context to the issue. One of the challenges that some news organizations have had in covering the Rohingya is just how political it can be to cover it solely from inside Myanmar. <clears throat> so we are one of the few news organizations that have actually been able to leverage the expertise of reporters on both sides of the border. That is, not only RFA's Burmese service reporters based in Yangon and traveling to Rakhine State, but also our affiliate Benar News' Bengali service, which has had a stringer consistently in the refugee camps of Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh, uh, beginning from last year. Um, that stringer actually was one of the first to document the systematic rapes committed by the Myanmar <coughs> military against the Rohingya refugees. Um, I have a video um, that that uh, um, that I want to show you guys, and and in this um, video that we've put together, and in our coverage more generally, we tried to not only show a real and detailed picture of what's happening during the crisis, but also to provide the historical context of entrenched racism within Myanmar and a look at what can happen in the future. Um, and this was this video was actually shown um, uh, at uh, a hearing on the Rohingya. Um, at the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Sort of unbeknownst to us beforehand, um, Chairman Royce decided to use it. So, please. More than one million Rohingya Muslims live in Buddhist-dominated Myanmar. Concentrated in Rakhine State, they have been referred to as the world's most persecuted minority group. Since August the 25th, 611,000 Rohingyas, about half the total population, have fled to neighboring Bangladesh for safety. Rohingya refugees have given graphic first-hand accounts of beatings, torture, rape, killing and arson by Myanmar's military and Buddhist nationalists. Satellite images confirm at least 288 Rohingya villages have been burned to the ground. The international community has accused Myanmar's military of ethnic cleansing, defined as a policy by one ethnic group to remove by violent or terror-inspiring means the civilian population of another ethnic or religious group from a certain geographic area.
The situation has spilled into the world's fastest developing refugee emergency and a humanitarian and human rights nightmare. Discrimination against the Rohingya has a long history in Myanmar. They're widely seen as illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, even though many families trace their roots in Rakhine State back to the 15th century. In 1982, the government granted citizenship to 135 ethnic groups, but not to the Rohingya. As stateless people, the Rohingya are deprived of employment, education, health services, voting rights and the freedom to move within the country. Violence against the Rohingya erupted in 2012, when four Muslim men were accused of raping and killing a Buddhist woman. Security forces and Buddhist nationalists beat ten Muslims to death. Thousands of Rohingyas fled into refugee camps. Tension between Rohingya and their Buddhist neighbors has continued to escalate. In October 2016, a Muslim militant group, the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army, or ARSA, began staging attacks on police and military targets in Rakhine State. On August 25, 2017, ARSA attacked dozens of police stations and killed 12 officers. Myanmar security forces responded with disproportionate brutality. According to United Nations estimates, the Myanmar military killed more than 3,000 Rohingyas. 611,000 Rohingya have fled to Bangladesh, joining 400,000 who were already living in refugee camps after earlier cycles of violence. Unsafe boats, overcrowded with refugees trying to escape, have capsized during the rough trip to Bangladesh. Scores, including women and children, have drowned or gone missing while trying to escape the Myanmar military. Bangladesh is struggling to accommodate the influx. Refugee camps are strained beyond capacity, lacking sufficient supplies and on the verge of a cholera outbreak. Myanmar's leader, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Aung San Suu Kyi, is facing fierce international criticism for saying and doing little about the attacks and ethnic cleansing in her country, where there is vast support for purging the Rohingya. The Myanmar government has refused to grant entry visas to members of a UN fact-finding mission appointed to investigate allegations of killings, rape and torture by security forces against the Rohingya. The situation remains, or seems, a textbook, uh, textbook example of ethnic cleansing. Bangladesh and Myanmar have met to discuss the repatriation of Rohingyas, but no time frame has been set. It's unclear how many refugees will be included or where they could return to, as most villages have been laid to waste. The Myanmar government has said it would welcome back anybody with appropriate identification papers. We are prepared to start the verification process at any time. Given that the Rohingya have never been recognized by the Myanmar government and have never received identification papers, this assertion is markedly disingenuous and rife with danger. The land vacated by fleeing Rohingya is prime farming land and lucrative for those who are claiming it now. Human rights groups have accused Myanmar's military of planting landmines along the Bangladesh border to prevent Rohingyas from returning home. More Rohingyas flee to Bangladesh every day as hunger and fear drive them from their homes in Rakhine State. I just want to apologize that some of the, the uh, images are difficult to see. We, um, we decided to keep them in just because it reflects the reality of the horrors that are happening. Yeah, no, I, I know you were sensitive to that, but in some t there are cases in journalism where you have to show the hardest pictures in order to make the real point. So with that, uh, we'll turn now to MBN. Uh, Chairman Weinstein, as you know, Alberto Fernandez took over about uh, three months ago, I guess it is now, Alberto, and has had a chance to really get the ball rolling over there in a way that I'm very excited about. And I asked Alberto to bring some examples of what he's thinking about going forward and some of the things they've already accomplished during his short tenure. So please go ahead. Um, Eat a mic. Thank you very much, John. It's uh, great to be here. Um, obviously, uh, we're deep into the implementing the vision of uh, transformation of MBN. Uh, 
that I've outlined early on and even before I started, and we're very much into the weeds of it. Um, a huge part of it is a part of personnel, um, and we were delighted to be able, I think the first picture comes up, we were delighted to be able to secure um, Nart Buran, um, who is uh, someone I've known professionally uh, in the Arab media space for 15 years when he was a young head of Jordanian television coming from Reuters, uh, and I was public affairs officer in Jordan. Uh, he's a, a guy with really strong uh, media credentials, both in Reuters and Reuters television. Uh, he built Sky News Arabia from scratch into a powerhouse, um, and um, he will be senior vice president for news content and innovation at uh, at MBN. It's really important because this is the first time in ten years that MBN has a journalist, a serious journalist, in such a senior position. It's a it's a gap and a vacuum that we've lacked for a decade. Uh, and uh, we are remedying that finally. Um, it's it, We have a long way to go, but I think it's a key addition to our team that will really help us transform what we're doing in a very dynamic, very, very changeable and, um, and um, um, complicated Arab media environment. Um, while we wait for NART to arrive in early 2018, we're working to continue to transform the work that we're doing. Um, and we're, you know, part a good part of that is to be more aggressive, is to be edgier, is to go into spaces where uh, beyond the red lines that Arab media, the pan Arab media, uh, allows. Pan Arab media is filled with stations; it's filled with the content, but it's actually deeply constrained, deeply limited in what it can cover. Um, so we're we're pushing the uh, pushing the envelope on that. We put together a documentary on the opioid crisis in the United States. Roll that uh, video, please. الأزمة الكبرى والمعضلة الكبرى بالنسبة لهذه المنطقة هي المعاناة من الاستهلاك المفرط للمخدرات خصوصا الهيروين وكذلك أعداد أخرى فالأرقام كبيرة جدا والأزمة أصبحت أزمة جدية جدا استكشفت هذا المكان وعثرت على الكثير من الأشياء من بينها حقن تستعمل في الحقن أو في حقن المخدرات وهي موجودة هنا ربما بالألاف أو ربما أكثر واعترف الكثيرون بأن هذا المكان هو مكان لاستهلاك المخدرات. I need a job. I need family. I need everything. You know, I, I don't want to step out more to the street. I don't want to. I don't want to use drugs. This, 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 this I'm talking about. This I'm talking about. So um, uh, this is one of the many ways we seek to make ourselves distinctive and to try to present content, which allows us to be more more aggressive. Part two of this is about the drug crisis in the Arab world. Uh, we're already filming in, in the region. And uh, not surprisingly, it's a lot harder to do in the Arab world than it is to do in the United States, given the kind of lack of transparency and lack of openness in dealing with the social issues and social crises. But initially, we thought... Uh, even though it's very difficult to do, initially we thought it would be uh, uh, hard because the the, the the drug crisis exists in certain countries in the Arab world. But actually, we found out that it's a major issue throughout the Arab world. It's just something that's not really talked about. So that's coming. Um, but we're not ignoring um, harder political issues, and we were delighted to be the first pan-Arab station um, to secure uh, an exclusive interview with National Security Advisor General McMaster. And roll that video, please. I think what, what really is necessary is to shine the light on Hezbollah. What are their actions? And what have been the consequences for the Lebanese people? We're working very hard uh, with our, our partners in the region and our allies broadly uh, to, to connect 
really what is happening on the ground in Syria to an enduring political settlement. It's actually the first time I can remember in watching Al Hura where I've seen uh, other stations steal from us rather than the other way around, which is a nice feeling. So. Great. Thank you, Alberto. Governors? Mm -hmm. Well done, sir. So transitioning now, I know we're running a little late. I apologize, but I have something really special to end on, and that's our David Burke Distinguished Journalism Award winners. Each year, the BBG honors high achievement with the David Burke Award. It's our highest award that we honor for any journalist in the agency. Winners from each of the five BBG networks are recognized for their courage, integrity, and professionalism. Our 2017 Burke Award winners exemplify these characteristics by tackling issues of global importance and putting themselves in danger to share stories of critical importance from some of the world's most dangerous places. They often put their own lives at risk and sometimes those of their families. It's important to recognize these outstanding individuals who risk their livelihoods to provide accurate, uncensored information to those who need it most. Yesterday, we held the ceremony for the award winners in the auditorium here at the Cohen Building. And I'd like to take this opportunity to highlight this year's winners, and then I'm going to show the short clips uh, from each of the, of the winners. From Voice of America, Heather Murdoch, their VOA Middle East correspondent for the strength, courage, and journalistic skills she demonstrated while documenting the drive by coalition forces to re retake the city of Mosul from ISIS. From the Office of Cuba Broadcasting, Ricardo Quintana, Marti journalist for documenting the difficult and dangerous immigration routes that many Cuban migrants took in their attempt to reach the U.S. From Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, the Uzbek service, you see them there, for their tireless and courageous determination to break stories and provide Uzbekistan citizens with a means to speak truth to power despite grave risks to themselves and their families. Radio Free Asia, Albert Hong, Hye Wan No, and He Jung Yang of RFA Korean for their fastidious investigative reporting that exposed a forced labor scheme by the North Korean government in seven countries. And Middle East Broadcasting Network's uh, Al Hura Iraq correspondent Abdul Hamid Zabari and cameraman Yazer Salim and John Saeed for taking extreme risks to accurately and objectively report on Iraq's deepening catastrophe as a result of ISIS's inhumane actions. So now uh, sit back and we'll roll all five of these winners and uh, video story and explanation. Please go ahead, Lori. In October of 2016, Voice of America Middle East correspondent Heather Murdoch began a five-month journey to document the coalition forces' efforts to retake the city of Mosul from ISIS militants. Throughout her time in the conflict zone, Heather was self-sufficient, doing her own camera work, lugging her own gear, and finding her own sources. And she produced some of the most heartfelt news coverage of a conflict much of the world has forgotten. Heather told the personal stories of war, as well as reported on the advances and setbacks of the Iraqi and Kurdish forces. Her reports helped VOA audiences track the forces backed by U.S. troops and understand what they faced in the operation. Through it all, Heather was tireless. From mid-October to late December, she produced more than 40 web, TV, and photo stories. She appeared multiple times on VOA and affiliate and TV programs, and she never faltered. She remained calm and rock steady, providing much needed information to her audiences.
To answer extreme media repression in Uzbekistan, RFERL's Uzbek service, known locally as Radio Ozodlik, is pioneering strategies to use new communication technologies to gather and distribute the news and build and engage local audiences remotely. With more than a million subscribers across several social media platforms and an average of 6 million views each month on YouTube, Radio Ozodlik provides a vital means to bypass the government's extreme censorship. The impact of Radio Ozodlik's reporting has been far-reaching. In August and September, Radio Ozodlik became the go-to source for news concerning the failing health and eventual death of Uzbek President Islam Karimov. By the time Uzbekistan's state-run information agency declared the news of his death, Radio Ozodlik had been posting on social media for days. Radio Ozodlik's reporting has also prompted the Uzbek Security Agency to launch nationwide inspections of nursery schools after the service published local testimony about multiple cases of child abuse and after-hours brothels being run in nursery schools in the South. But this reporting comes at great risk. Courageous stringers denied accreditation by the Uzbek government face tremendous threats on a daily basis. And Ozo League journalists, most of whom are banned from entering their homeland, have had property seized by the government and have had relatives persecuted and imprisoned. Their bravery has allowed RFERL's Uzbek service to break stories from around the country each day, but more important, to give Uzbekistan's citizens a powerful means to speak truth to power in one of the least free societies in the world. In 2012, Cubans defecting to the United States began taking a new route through South and Central America. The dangerous journey could take several months and often cost individuals their life savings. But by 2015, thousands of Cubans were making their harrowing journey. Several nations along the route closed their borders, leaving tens of thousands stranded. Because the Cuban state media neglects to cover any defection, more emigrants seeking a better life continued to plot their way, despite the route being closed. Marti reporter Ricardo Quintana traveled these routes, including to dangerous and remote sites, such as the Darien jungle in Colombia, Puerto Abaldia in Panama, and the drug cartel-controlled territories near the U.S.-Mexico border. Along the way, he documented the dangers of the passage, told the personal stories of sacrifice and hope, and provided Cubans back home with important information about the risky journey. His courageous and excellent reporting helped win the Martis an Emmy for the documentary Cambio de Ruta and provided Cubans with life-saving information they couldn't get elsewhere. Three RFA journalists, Albert Hong, Jae Wang No, and He Jung Yang, investigated North Korea's overseas labor throughout the world. Desperate for hard currency, North Korea has been forcibly sending tens of thousands of its citizens abroad to earn cash for the state, dispatching construction workers to the Middle East and Northeast Asia, farmhands to Poland, doctors to staff unlicensed medical facilities across Africa, and waitresses to Cambodia. The journalists' combined efforts, which took them to seven countries in four continents, resulted in an in-depth multimedia series that documented the lives of these workers. They reported on the difficult workplace conditions and the outrageously low wages. But they also exposed dangers, particularly malpractice at North Korean-run health facilities. The impact of the investigative reports was swift and decisive. In April, the Tanzanian government ordered the immediate closure of two North Korean medical clinics in Dar es Salaam because the facilities used fake medicine, unqualified doctors, and inefficient treatments that could actually harm patients. 
The hard work and selfless dedication of these RFA journalists no doubt saved lives and exposed abuses by the North Korean government on its own people. the 2016 campaign to end ISIS's brutal rule in Mosul, three Alhara Iraq journalists risked their lives to report on developments close to the front lines. Correspondent Abdul Hamid Zabari and cameraman Yasser Salim and Johan Saeed worked tirelessly to bring an accurate picture of the reality in Mosul. Often, they embedded with Iraqi and Peshmerga troops to bring viewers the latest news from the front lines. They also created intimate portraits of families fleeing, struggling to survive in the midst of war, suffering from injuries at hospitals, and living in camps for internally displaced people. But the risks were great. While embedded with Iraqi counterterrorism forces outside of Mosul, the three journalists came under attack. Zabari and Salim were hit by shrapnel, and Saeed rushed them to an emergency medical facility. Even following this ordeal, they remained committed to their pursuit of the truth, and continued to report on the fight for Mosul. Through their courage and determination, as well as their deep understanding of the area, the Mosul team of Sabari, Salim, and Saeed provided a clear picture of the high-stakes conflict. Their reporting has provided valuable and accurate information to the people of Iraq and throughout the Middle East, equipping them with the information needed to rebuild their lives. And that is our report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. CEO and Director. Uh, it's obviously, it's incredibly inspiring to see this work and to think back to, uh, we, be we, began these, we begin these board meetings by talking about uh, those of our colleagues who've been imprisoned, those, the two deaths that we mentioned um, as a result of that uh, terrorist blast in Mogadishu to see the incredible danger that uh, our teams uh, put themselves under uh, in Mosul and elsewhere, and it's um, to see the remarkable work that comes out and understand the unbelievable challenges that are, that the men and women in the field uh, are, face every single day. It's, it's, it's absolutely extraordinary, and uh, particularly at this time when our, our work is certainly more needed than ever around the globe. So I just want to congratulate you and congratulate everyone around the table at this uh, a uh, very challenging moment in global affairs uh, at the remarkable work that's being produced and the incredible courage and tenacity of our teams in the field. I don't, I don't know if there are other governors who have comments or questions. Okay, well, no, thank you very much, John. That was an excellent report. I want to thank everyone again around the table. The next board meeting will be held here at BBG headquarters in Washington on March 14th, 2018. I'll work closely with my fellow governors and CEO Lansing to develop the agenda for this meeting. I encourage all governors to give me or BBG staff on input on topics you wish to see addressed at the next meeting. Do any governors wish to move to adjourn the meeting? I so move.